Hello and welcome to your lecture. In this video, I wanna go over the concepts uh, of health and wellness. This will be your guide to conscious health and wealth. Now the term wealth is something I utilize to express profit that health gives us. So let's start by going over some terms that we hear. Now, some of these, I interject my own understanding and how I utilize the words and others are by definition. So we will review the word health in a minute. We will uh, get to understand healing a little bit better. I will give you my definition of fitness, wellness, and well-being. So health, many people define it as um, the condition of being in sound body, mind, or spirit. That's Merriam-Webster definition. The World Health Organization, though, adds on to that and says it's not merely the absence of disease or infirmary. And the actual word health originates from an old English root, H-A-E-L-T-H, which means wholeness. So even in the definition of health, I think there's an ambiguity there. But also, it demonstrates in all of these that there's more than one part to it, particularly the Merriam-Webster thing, particularly the origin of the word health. It already means health whole, holism, holistic. I think what we know now, because we all have bodies and lives, is health is a moving target and the goal posts seems to change repeatedly. And that is very true. As we age, as we gain life experiences, as we um, move forward on our life path, we understand that it changes. What we require at one point will not be the same thing that we will require at another um, milestone within our life in order to maintain some level of wholeness. Health, I hope we know this, is extremely individual, which makes it really difficult to actually apply protocols or blanket statements. It's extremely individual. Now let's go through the terminology. So we understand a little bit better what health actually is. It's a state of wholeness, right? Healing then is dynamic and perpetual. It is the alchemical journey to get to wholeness. It will require behavior modification, course correction, and balance in all of the dimensions of health. And what we will find is when we work with one dimension of health, which we'll clarify in a minute, we're gonna get benefit in other dimensions of health or change in other dimensions of health. Fitness, the way that I use that term is to denote strength. Strength, because you can be mentally fit, you can be physically fit, you can be emotionally fit. You can be financially fit. Wellness then to me is the act of practice. We have a wellness practice. So health and wellness. Health being holism or holistic. And wellness is the act of practice that we embark on to get there. Well-being then really is a mental emotional state of peace. When we have well-being on the inside, it means all is well, no matter what the outside looks like. I feel like when we are on a journey to come into wholeness, where we have a wellness practice, practice and stated to get to wholeness, um, what we're really after is well-being when all parts come together. So I think well-being is our ultimate target. So let's break some of this down and understand the different paradigms of health. 
the paradigm of health um, can be linked by its style of reasoning or its philosophical foundation or how we think we get to wholeness. And there are two primary paradigms of health that we can recognize. They are reductionism and holism. So reductionistic views say um, that the whole is just equal to the sum of the parts, meaning it's very mechanistic, kind of like plumbing or a car, right? You take it apart and put it together and the same, it should be good as new. Um, it has precision and specialties uh, and acute care from that mechanistic perspective. It tends to be divisionary so that it can have the specialties. When we dip into the pole of holistic healthcare or holism, this, this philosophy says that the whole is much bigger than the sum of its parts, meaning you can't rip things apart. It's vitalistic. It says, yes, we have all these pieces and parts together, but there's a vital life force that cannot be uh, synthesized differently. It tends to be a more unified approach, not um, as divisionary or oppositional, but also not as specific. The wellness practices imbibed within a holistic approach, uh, I already mentioned this, will have like a broad spectrum benefit. So you can work with one thing and get benefit in other dimensions of health. Now, under these umbrellas of paradigms, we stick different models or approaches. Now, a model of health is kind of, this would be a more, um, definitive framework of how we go about getting to wholeness, health, and well-being. This would include things like a spiritual model, a wellness model, or the biomedical model. Spiritual and wellness models tuck up under the holistic model, and actually most Models outside of the biomedical model will fit up under the holistic approach. So the focus in holism is really on um, prevention, nourishment, replenishment. In holism, you start at the cell. You start at the root to change the outcome. In a biomedical model, which is what our conventional medical model is primarily focused on. This is a reductionistic model. The treatment is aimed directly at the symptom or at the diagnosis rather than merging it with the holistic approach of looking at the cell. The biomedical model tends to use a cure concept. We hear the word cure a lot. That is not personally my favorite word because I feel like if you think there's a cure, you like you quit trying. You quit doing the holistic part. You quit doing your part, our part. So when we're talking about, again, this principle of holism, bringing things together, it tells us there's more than one part. So depending on what book you read and what resource you read, you're going to look, you're going to find noted different dimensions of health. These are the ones that I think are pretty easy to put in a box. Now, the, the tough part is each one will bleed into the next. So really, there's no hierarchy here. They go in a circle. You impact, again, you, you mess with one and you're going to impact the others. And it's really, actually really hard to put them in boxes. So the physical dimension of health, this would include like the musculoskeletal as well as the structure of your cells. So this is your body. Um, I plunk in here stress because stress can is actually quite biochemical and we can put sleep in here. I would put nutrition in here uh, all because it deals with cellular mechanics, hormones, neurotransmitters, 
what you're, what you're going to feel in your body. Then we have the environmental, um, and, and I clump these together, environmental, mission, occupation, and financial. Um, environmental health can be like safety in the workplace on all levels, whether it's chemical safety, uh, machinery safety, um, social safety, but also I think that included in our environmental, uh, well, also not even just, I think environmental can be, you know, like toxins in your environment. Maybe you're a farmer, right? And environmental safety as far as toxicity would be considered there. But I think that in this category, we need to, we need to maybe call it occupational and then it can include all of these other things. Because within the occupational realm, we have to talk about mission. Do you have a purpose? We will work better if we feel our work has value. This also gives rise to our financial health. So this is one area of health that I think is sometimes forgotten. If we are financially stressed, our physical health will not be well our mental emotional health will not be well. So once again, one area of well-being impacts all the others. Then we have to look at social health. This could be friendships, family ships, um, but also uh, intimate partnerships and sexual responsibility. Mental, emotional, uh, they're actually two different things. So I classify mental and intellectual in one category, in one dimension. This is mental clarity. This is um, uh, thinking, learning, studying also. So this will be behavior oriented as well. And then we have the emotional dimension. This is understanding and or learning healthy processing of emotions, as well as healthy expression of feelings. And the spiritual dimension. Spiritual dimension, uh, we could put culture in here because they're, they're related oftentimes, not always, but uh, spirituality, I need you to know now, and we'll touch on this later throughout the course, that it's really about being authentically who you were intended to be and choosing your highest potential. When we talk spirituality, it's not um, any religious construct. When we're going through all of the dimensions of health, one thing you'll hear me say a lot is the word contrast. Contrast in relationship to health is something you don't want to be there, but here it is. So oftentimes there are things that will land that we cannot change. Maybe sometimes we don't want to, we don't care to, it doesn't matter to us. But a contrasting health event is something like you didn't plan, you didn't intend, and it landed anyway. So it makes you feel potentially or reflects to you that you're, you're, you're not whole, you're not healthy. There's something that's not balanced. The way that contrast is delivered to you, the way that you come to the awareness, you could it could be a symptom, it could be a test, it could be through this health this um, health class and the questionnaires, or it could be a reflection from family or friends. Let's talk through what healing is, the healing process. First of all, healing, actual healing, coming into that state of wholeness requires change growth and expansion. If you're not willing to take different actions, you're not interested in actually healing. If you have a contrast that you just don't want right now, that would be bypassing. And there's no judgment there. Everyone's on their own path and their own journey. And they must choose if right now in this minute, they were delivered a contrast. Do they want to deal with it? Or do they need to bypass right now? So healing is a process. It is not an event and it actually never ends. There will always be something to work on. It is alchemy, okay? It's learning to grow roses from the manure pile. It's 
taking something that oh, you didn't want to have happen and yet here it is and then learning to either absolve it and dissolve it or come to peace with it healing is not the cure sometimes again i'm not crazy about the word cure because it we think like everything's all done no oftentimes what is presented as a cure is a bypass to the actual root cause of a healing meaning it could come back right so um what we what we are after is an absolution in our toolbox healing is a spiral staircase you will just perpetually peel layers away resistance and pain and patterns layer by layer one thing we have to understand also is that through any healing there's going to be what we call a healing event a healing crisis a Herxheimer reaction something where your body and your life have to readjust to a new pattern a new method a new choice a new way of being a new whatever it is when we actually embark on a healing journey it is heavily steeped in self-awareness and self-empowerment and we'll get into self-empowerment in the next lecture a little bit more. We also have to understand that healing is the opposite of free from pain or discomfort or symptoms. In fact, it's the opposite. Okay, if you're truly taking active measures toward healing any contrast in, in any dimension of health, as you work through it, you'll have to like refeel it, revisit it, retrace it. It's facing what is present and staying committed to the new choices, the change and the higher road. So when you want to heal something, I think there's a template that we can use when healing. And It'll go something like this. You have to have an awareness that something isn't quite right or the way that you want it. This is a sign, a symptom, or a test. Then you have to acknowledge it and accept it. Acknowledgement and acceptance aren't quite the same thing. Acknowledgement is saying, oh, it's the thing. Okay. Like, say you have in, you know, you break out in hives, for example. The awareness would be the symptom of a hive. The acknowledgement is going, Oh, I actually have hives. Okay. Accepting it is like, all right, well, they're here now. What do I do? So when we do the acknowledgement and the acceptance, it's really powerful to make sure that you're doing that in some type of safe space, like a practitioner's office or, you know, a journal, whatever you're working through, because this can be used for mental, emotional stuff as well. And then you have to do, when we do the acknowledgement portion, we have to also acknowledge our participation in whatever landed. Okay, it's here now. Did I do something? Did some of my choices allow this contrast to be here? And if so, what are they? Okay, and then, and the, and then what is sort of the acceptance part. So, all right, my hives are here. Now, what do I do? And if they never go away, if I always have hives forever, then what? Or, okay, I don't want them here. What do I do? Kind of thinking. When we step into the neutralizing phase, this is where we're going to identify the opposite. Well, I have hives. So what's the opposite of having hives? I don't want hives. We just acknowledge or recognize the opposite thing of the contrast. Now, when we elevate, this is playing the positive games. Okay, so so I have hives. I don't want them. Okay, they're here. Maybe I ate strawberries and I'm allergic to strawberries and that's what it did it. Okay, um, well, I don't want them. I want no hives today, please. But what when we play the positives game, it's going, all right, well... Um, the way we play the positives is you pull in two positives out of the experience. All right, so I wasn't really aware that the cereal I ate had strawberries in it. So that gave me hives. Now I have to pay closer attention. This will make me pay closer attention to what I'm actually doing. Um, 
this made me, this experience made me, you know, um, go buy a new shirt. That was a positive experience and that was fun or something like that. When we integrate, this would be like um, integration and purging kind of go together because we, we understand the activities we will keep. And then purging is throwing out the ones we're not going to. So if within this experience of me eating cereal with strawberries in it, decide what current action would support my goal. Um, I would say not doing that. <laughs> okay. The integration is being more consciously aware of what I'm eating or what I'm surrounded by or what food my friends have at their house. So I'm not going to do that anymore. That would be the purge. And then my devotion to myself and my higher timeline. Look, I don't like hives. They're really uncomfortable, right? So um, I'm going to commit to myself to pay closer attention and not eat strawberries. When we talk about a daily health devotion, I think it's really good practice to get into that every morning you spend a couple, this doesn't have to take long, you spend a couple minutes, 30 seconds if you have it, just kind of going through what you did yesterday, reflecting on what you did um, regarding your health. How did you do? I did great here. I did bad here. Or, you know, I, I really worked hard in this area, but I wasn't so strong in this area. So today I'm going to take baby steps in strengthening my physical health and go for a walk today or something like that. Um, and then throughout the day, checking in with myself, periodically being conscious of my thoughts, being conscious of my feelings, being conscious of my actions, and only taking action that match my highest timeline and my desired um, manifested goal or outcome. And when you're when you're really checking in with yourself all day long, you can really course correct the little things so that you're always aware. And then the bigger health contrasts are less likely to happen. When we are reflecting on the, our health goals, whatever they may be, timing, persistence, integrity, active engagement, motivation, and you know, enforcing consequences will come into play as we uh, operate our health in a far more conscious manner. Okay, behavior change. This is a big one, and I need you to pay attention to behavior change. Th these are the stages of change, and these are pretty consistent across the board, depending on your resource that you look at, but not necessarily. Again, depends on what book you're reading. But when you are on a wellness journey or healing journey, you, behavior change has to be it, okay? So there is a large mental component to healing, to health, to acquiring the health that you say you want. Because if you're not willing or ready to take correspondent action in the direction that you say you want to go, then he, it's not time yet. So the five general stages of change. Pre-contemplation means you're not ready. Uh, you're either not aware, um, or, or I would say you're not aware. <laughs> you're not going to do anything because you don't know that there's anything to do. You you haven't come into the awareness that you have this behavior or this pattern or this action that you keep doing that is going to land you a detrimental result or a health contrast. Now, when we get into contemplation, this is when we begin to go, huh, why does this keep happening? Why does this keep happening? You will get that information. If you start asking the questions, you're gonna get the information. So we begin to recognize we have something uh, problematic. When you're in the prep stage of change, this is when you're ready. You're ready to start now. I think the key 
to the prep phase is baby steps. Because because consciousness in all of these patterns and actions and choices, this takes work. This takes a lot of work. This is self-healing at the highest level. Action is when, if we're in an action stage, we're, we're making changes. Okay, this is not getting ready to make changes. This is actively going, I've had it, I'm changing. That's prep. When you actually go do the thing, that's action. Maintenance is the hardest stage to maintain because it is super easy to fall back into mental patterns. And these are like neurological wires that you've been doing forever that have unconsciously been running your template. So when you come to an awareness that something keeps delivering, delivering you something that you don't want in any dimension of health, you really begin to uh, need to change. But maintaining it when you're stressed and need to reach for something fast is so common to slip back into old patterns. This one takes fortitude to hold and maintain. Okay, uh, that's all for this lecture. We will see you in the next one.